I think we're ready to kick off. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're extremely lucky to have such an incredible guest join us this evening. Mark Abel is regarded as one of South Africa's leading marketing and advertising practitioners. He is the founder and chief executive of MNC Saatchi Abel and the MNC Saatchi Group of Companies in South Africa. He's the former CEO of MNC Saatchi Group Australia, and before that, co-led the Ogilvy South Africa Group as CEO and Group Managing Director. Mark has been awarded Advertising Leader in South Africa by both the Financial Mail and Finweek, and his company was named Large Agency of the Year in 2015 as well as in 2019. Mark, it is a great honor to have you on our talk this evening, and I'd like to thank you very much for giving up your time. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark to hear more around who he is, where is he from, and what he gets up to on a daily basis. Ryan and myself will be asking my questions, but I urge you all please to post any questions which you may have, which you may have in the Q&A box on top of your screens, and obviously we'll try our best to address them all. Once again, Mark, thank you very much for your time. Over to you, and then we'll get straight into it. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and the kind words. It's uh, lovely to be on your webinar this evening and looking forward to engaging with you guys and with the audience. So a bit of background, I guess, to your question. Um, I'm a PE boy originally, started studying architecture, didn't enjoy it, changed very quickly to start doing a BA, BA psychology, didn't enjoy that either. Eventually stumbled into studying marketing for three years, did a postgrad in advertising, and then in my day, you had to do conscription in the army. Uh, so I was conscripted, and while I was in the army, I was uh, sent to run the army shops after, in the Eastern Cape after um, basic training I called Savi, and I arrived there, and uh, I saw it was just a very uh, basic camp, and they had a shop uh, that sold groceries, and they had a shop that sold takeaways, and very quickly I introduced credit, and I introduced white goods, bridges, stoves, microwave ovens, exactly what you'd expect to get to start doing hustling, and introduced uh, credit. And uh, after that year, I had raised the turnover by 16 times. <laughs> and I was awarded a military uh, uh, a military award uh, for uh, raising the preparedness of the command. And I always used to think that um, if we were ever attacked, the only thing I could do was hit the enemy with the cash register, um, because that's pretty much what I learned in the army. Anyway, I started my first ad agency. Um, in the late 80s, um, uh, operating out of the townships in Port Elizabeth during apartheid. Um, I opened it uh, with Unclero Black Taxi Association, uh, and basically it was advertising with Contravision on the back window of taxis. And then um, while I was in the army, I did my, my state agents exam, and um, I uh, knew it was very difficult, even back then, to get a job in advertising. And I wanted to work at one of the best agencies in South Africa. Eventually, I was offered a job at the White House in Cape Town. Uh, nothing to do with Donald Trump or Joe Biden, I'll have you know. And uh, I joined the White House. And very soon after I joined, I was asked to be involved in the repositioning of Woolworths from um, their former logo and product offering to the Woolies that we know today, was very involved in writing the strategy for Discover the Difference. They still use the difference, funny enough, almost 30 years later. Um, and then I was sent to start the White House Johannesburg at the ripe old age, I think of 24, into a fully fledged ad agency. They just had a, a small um, branch there and my job was really to grow it. So at age 24, toddled off to Johannesburg and started the White House with a creative director called Ricardo de Carvalho. You can read all about that in my book. And then I um, was uh, in Joburg. We pitched on eight accounts. We won all eight accounts. And then Ogilvy South Africa approached me in 1993 to join them and work on the Volkswagen account. And I had a 15 year love affair with the Volkswagen Audi brand, worked on Old Mutual and on Shell and then BP. Ended up running Emmons, sorry, ended up running Ogilvy Cape Town in 2001 as quite a young man, uh, and then had to focus on growing the group nationally. And then over the next four or five years, I grew Ogilvy Cape Town into the largest ad agency in South Africa from Cape Town. Um, and we were just a traveling agency. We were in Joburg pretty much all week in those days. And then in 2006, I became the co-leader of Ogilvy South Africa Group with Nunun Chingila, who was the CEO. 
And then in 2008, I was offered the position to run the MNC Saatchi Group Australia. I emigrated with my wife and three boys to Australia, uh, to Sydney, and I worked out of the city. And uh, after um, about three, four months in Australia, um, I was offered uh, to start MNC Saatchi in South Africa. The intention was never for me to come back to South Africa. Um, I was going to run Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and play a broader role in Asia. But my wife was very homesick living in Australia, and we thought it was a great opportunity to come back and start the agency in South Africa. And so towards the end of 2009, I notified them that I'd come back and start the agency in South Africa. And we started MNC Saatchi Able on the 1st of uh, February 2010. So we are turning 11 in February next year. And it's been the most un unbelievable journey. Today we have uh, offices across um, Cape Town and Johannesburg. We've got six distinct companies in our group. And wow. it's been a great adventure. Wow, well done. Phenomenal story. Thank um, you. Mark, I'm just going to jump in and then Ron, I think maybe if you've got just some questions, just based on your story. You said you studied, I mean, you studied, started off architecture, then you went to marketing. Yeah. Do you think that's a prerequisite to get into your industry? I'm saying, is it a natural thing that people tend to have to be a great I mean, marketing agent or be, have an R for advertising? Or do you, you think you actually need the basis, the fundamentals, and then you rely on your inherent skills? I definitely think if you want to go into the business and strategy side of advertising, it is preferable. It's not essential. I mean, if you have a, an inherent talent and you are a voracious consumer of marketing textbooks and you don't study it, I suppose it would be uh, all right. But uh, definitely preferable to go into the business side and the strategy side, having a marketing qualification of a minimum of, uh, of three years. Um, and then if you want to be in the creative side, definitely to go and study graphic design or study English copywriting at a red and yellow or a Vega or a AAA, most certainly. It's not a, a career you can walk into without today um, having, I think, at least um, a three-year qualification. Sure. sure, it's becoming also quite a competitive space at the moment. And how, do you, how does one differentiate themselves in the space with their ideas, with their vision? Um, how do you, yeah, how talent. Do you, talent. Talent, really talent. As, you know, as, as, as we always say at the agency, uh, you know, kind of talent is your passport to career progression. You know, you can work really hard um, yeah. and you can be very committed and very dedicated. But unless you um, can think creatively and be a good problem solver, you are unlikely to progress um, ahead of your uh, colleagues because ultimately our business is about being a commercial psychologist, which means uh, being able to apply your understanding of the human mind and motivations in order to sell. That's why clients come to us. Clients come to us for three things. They want us to be able to grow their top line, their market share and their brand equity. And unless you know how to do that, you're not going to succeed. Oh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I hear oh, that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, very interesting, Mark. Um, you know, I like the word commercial psychologist. You know, the space, I suppose, people deem to think it's all driven around talent. But I think based on your brief explanation on your background, you had that commercial business acumen that that took you from one step to the next and and and, and enabled you to grow such a large business. And you know, off the back of that. You know, I think we should touch base on your, your most recently launched book. So as an audience may not know, Mark recently launched a book this year um, called Willing and Able, um, Lessons Learned from a Decade of Crisis. And perhaps let's jump into that. Can you tell us a bit more about it? You know, why did you start this book? Was it always something that you dreamed of? What is the book about? And, you know, let's enlighten the audience. So the book started uh, with the intention of it being around the 10-year anniversary of MNC Saatchi Able and the group of companies we started. And then it evolved. So as we got to our 10th birthday, my partner said to me, actually, the book shouldn't really be about us. It should be about you and your career. And it wouldn't be a 10-year book necessarily, but it would be a 30-year book. 
I guess the thing for me, though, um, Ryan, is that the intention of the book is to use the lessons learned over my 30-year career, and particularly the last 10 years since I started the MNC Saatchi Able Group with my partners from scratch, to do two things. One is to use case studies, stories, and lessons to be useful for people, to, for people to be able to apply those lessons in their own business. You know, where I talk about cash flow is blood flow and, you know, um, how you start a business and what you need in terms of uh, the prerequisites for success, I guess. Um, and then the other intention, I guess, was to inspire people around being able to start their own businesses in a downturned economy, where I talk also about South Africa, I talk about the political spectrum, I am outspoken, I write a lot of open letters, which you guys referenced earlier, uh, I write a lot for the Daily Maverick and other publications, and, uh, and I'm a patriot, you know, I'm an active citizen and I try to help uh, build the economy in the country. And so um, that's all the stuff that I cover in my book. And the reason I wrote a book is I often get requests like tonight to talk to people. And there's, an, there's a finite amount of people that I can help at any one time. So the intention was to write the book and help as many people as possible in terms of, uh, I guess, navigating their businesses to an extent, navigating adversity, challenges that happen in life. You know, I always equate it to that well-known um, analogy. You know, people look at Mike Abel's laugh and it's like a swan gliding across the dam, but they don't see those feet paddling frantically beneath the surface. Uh, and so what I do is uh, I take people beneath the surface a little bit and show them, you know, kind of how to, uh, to build a company and a business. Sure, that's incredible. And um, so for the likes of it, it sounds like it's a very objective book. It appeals to the wider the wider spectrum of people to all businesses and all fronts at all ages and something that I think we should all learn from, especially from a guy like yourself, having gone through a lot of experience, um, it would be, you know, very enlightening to, 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 to get involved in this. And, you know, that's, that's very interesting. Um, how has, how, how is, how has the, the uptake been on the book so far? Um, you know, what is, what has been the, the, the response? What has been, what has the market, you know, reacted according yeah. to it? So we launched the book officially two weeks ago was the first launch um, in Cape Town. And then last week was the first launch in Johannesburg. So we're actually very early into the launch of the book. Uh, we've sold on average um, three times the normal amount of books within the first uh, couple of weeks. So my publishers at Burnett Media are very excited at the uptake of the book. Um, and to your point earlier, what I've loved about it is a lot of people are sending me photographs on my phone and Facebook and uh, Twitter and showing them of them reading the book. And the majority of those people that are sending those photographs in are not from the advertising industry at all. And they do span a very broad audience of people that are retired, people that are successful and senior in their position and people that are starting off. So the intention was there is something for everybody in the book because it's about life more than anything else and life lessons in business. So right now I am very thrilled and encouraged and you know to be invited onto webinars like this tonight is also terrific to be able to to talk to the audience to talk to you guys and uh, and engage. Yeah, I, yeah. 100% I think I think let's look forward and it will be quite exciting to see when your next book comes out. So you know, based on the success of this, which I have no doubt will will shoot it shoot it out the stars, we'll, we'll we'll soon have a webinar with with book number two, life after the decade after the crisis. But on that note, you mentioned something in relation to business decisions as well as human relation decisions and emotional decisions in an everyday life. You know, do you set have a set core principles when you when you that you align when making these decisions, and if so, what they and and what drove you to to, to make the decisions. And, you know, if you could sum up, I know obviously it might be a difficult one, but at our core principles, how, how can we, how can we learn? How can we gain? And, you know, what insight can, can you, can you give us on those, those principles? Sure. So I have a number of governing principles or belief systems that I'm very happy to share with you tonight. And you happy to take a note. You, you make your notes, go ahead. So send in the, send in the, send in the invoice after. <laughs> so you know um, there's an old kabbalistic belief i'm told which is in life you get because of what you give not because of what you take 
So I have always believed in trying to create an inclusive economy, a sharing culture. I've always believed in having a small part of something extraordinary than a large part of something ordinary. I like to surround myself with people that I know, like, and trust before I get to them, even having the requisite skill for the job. I do believe that life is too short to work with assholes. I'm not sure I can use that word on a Chabad webinar, but there you go. Sorry, Rabbi. Um, you want to work with good human beings and decent people. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I like to do is, you know, there's a saying that the bird of paradise never lands on the grasping hand. So I don't like to work with greedy people. I like to work with kind people. Um, so those, are, I guess, are my, my overarching things. I am a very positive person, so I have no time for negativity. It's not that I don't acknowledge negativity. I most certainly do. So I am a realist. I am uh, burdened with realism, but blessed with positivity. And so I am solutions orientated because I don't believe that wallowing in self-pity achieves anything other than taking you further down a vortex of negativity. You know, there's a wonderful story by uh, um, of Wilfred Owen, who was a poet during the um, First World War. As it happened, he actually died during the First World War in trench warfare. But he said every night that he stood in the trenches, he was faced with a choice. He could either look down and see his feet in the mud, or he could look up and see the stars. And uh, I choose to look up always, as do my partners and colleagues. And when you look at our agency and how we even approached the COVID crisis and closing the agency for that, um, we had one sign on our door in Cape Town and Johannesburg, and it said, our doors may be closed, but our minds remain open. And I gave our staff, all 350 of them in South Africa, a very clear message. I said, wouldn't it be amazing to do the best work that we've ever done during lockdown? Um, and I think that that set the tone for people to solve problems, to imagine, to look constructively at their situation and not to just um, bunker down and lose hope and faith. Sure. It seems like you're more than, than just a, a, you know, a director or a manager, more of a mentor. And that's, that's, that's the, the feeling I'm getting. And you know, maybe I need to reposition my, my career path. But um, I think Hilly, Hilly, Hilly can jump in and he might have one or cool. two more questions. But thank you for that. That was really I mean, a lot. I've got my own notes. <laughs> I think you're spot on, Ron. I think uh, mentorship seems like Mark plays that role. Mark, do you have a mentor? Is somebody, you know, you mentioned you tend to look up. Is there somebody you look up to or and who you, you try to gain guidance or inspiration from? Sure. Well, I'm very fortunate to work with um, co-founders in the company that have been my very good friends and colleagues for many years. Many of them I worked with before we even started the agency in my former days at Ogilvy. So I think that those are very um, trusted business partners and friends, and they inspire me as much as I hopefully uh, try and inspire them. Um, I have had uh, my same closest friends my whole life. Uh, you know, my best friend that, uh, that has been my best friend my entire life, a guy called John Cowdery, who lives in London, is still my best friend today, a very brilliant man. Um, and, uh, and all of my friends from school, uh, I've remained close to. But I um, am very fortunate in so far as um, having had the most brilliant parents. My mom has sadly passed away, but she's a very brilliant lady. My dad's a very inspirational man. And I had amazing grandparents, particularly my grandfather, who was a very brave and brilliant man uh, called Dr. Phil Pearl. And they inspired me. And I haven't forgotten any of the lessons from my parents and my grandparents and my, my friends. Um, so, um, and then my boys, I've got three sons and they inspire me uh, and they mentor me and they slap me into shape. You know, I come I, at work, I'm very important. And then when I come home, I become this idiot that needs to be slapped around uh, like we all do. <laughs> you guys will see one yeah, day. They're and keeping so, you young. That was my role in the house was to keep my parents young. Exactly so, right. So they they're fulfilling their role. Yeah. You can't exactly. blame them. They're fulfilling their role. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So it's my so it's family, it's friends, it's my buddies. I've got another very close friend, Ali Wilson. All of them that kind of keep me in check and you know send me stuff every day and challenge me and uh, and I think you know not that I've ever needed you know it's a funny thing and I don't want to say this in a pretentious way, Hilly, but 
you know, people often say to me, you know, Mike, as long as we've known you, you've never changed, you know, as you've been become, I guess, more successful in your career. And my question is always change to who or change to what? And I've never understood why people believe their own bullshit or, um, you know, uh, crawl up their own ass with self-importance. You know, we are all equal. You know, we're all here just to play different roles. And so I kind of look at my life as like a, you know, just a member on, on a soccer team or a rugby team. And, uh, and, uh, and if I am the captain of that team, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to get tackled. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to foul every now and then when I hope not to or get sent off the field. But, uh, you know, as I say, in our company, you know, Great we don't analogy. have... Ferguson in our company. There's nobody on the side of the field with a whistle. You're either on the field playing the game or you're out the stadium. It's as simple as that. I love that analogy. I know we said we'll keep questions till the end, but there's a question comes through from Karina Govinda. And she says, Mark, what is, what is something you would like to be remembered for or a legacy you would like to leave? And I think that's quite relevant to the discussion we have in now. So I'd like to just bring it in. Um, I think that I measure my life through my contribution to the world, I guess. And, and if it's smaller than the world, then just to my family, to my community, to my colleagues, to my friends, the people around me. So I like to make a difference. So if people think that I've made a positive difference, that's good enough for me. Um, uh, it's not anything about uh, kind of shiny baubles and awards. And of course they're nice to get, it's lovely to get recognition. Um, but I don't measure my success in material terms. Uh, I, I look at my life in terms of contribution, I guess, and making a difference. Uh, the thing that I'm most proud of in my career, funnily enough, is in 2014, we've got a, a homeless shelter around the corner from the ad agency in Cape Town. And uh, one of my young creative guys, a guy called Max Pitsak, was particularly concerned around the homeless people because uh, like the Game of Thrones, winter was coming. And uh, he was very concerned that these homeless people didn't have shoes, didn't have jerseys. And so um, I got a call from Gordon Ray and he, uh, who's the, who was the, um, one of the co-founders of the company. And he called me and he said, Mike, I want you to come downstairs and have a look at something amazing. So I went downstairs uh, to Gordon's office together with uh, Jason Harrison, who's our group MD. And sitting there was uh, Max Pitsuk and Kaylee Levitt and the creative team. And I looked at this idea and really what it was, uh, Hilly was the world's first rent-free, premises-free, free pop-up clothing store for the homeless. So it was basically using four posters to run uh, a shop where for the first time ever, homeless people could have a genuine shopping experience where they could choose clothing that they liked, clothing that they needed, clothing that fitted them. And... Uh, it was unbelievably successful. And so what we did was we made the street store open source where people could download all of the marketing material and uh, instructions and paraphernalia to run their own street stores. And just before COVID, we had almost reached a thousand street stores around the world, wow. clothed hundreds of thousands of homeless people, and it's become a global movement. So one of the things that I'd like to be remembered for, I guess, is being a patron of the street store. Wow. And then... One of my good mates, uh, Gidon Novik, uh, started a hotel group called Home Sweet Hotels. You know, he's just launched an airline called Lyft. And, uh, and so when you start Gidon's hotel and other hotels, there's also now a hangar that hangs in all of the rooms where we encourage people when they travel to leave an item or two of clothing behind that also goes to clothe the homeless people. Um, sorry, Hilly, I just wanted to interrupt you for one second. Mark, you, you've, you've, you've recalled me for an interesting memory. When I studied in Cape Town, I actually built inspiration off, off this, and I didn't know you were behind it. And myself and a group of friends, we formed a low level, not a low level, but a, a, a very small charity group, um, which has been slightly dormant for a couple of years. But we, we did a pop-up store ourselves um, mm -hmm. in Cape Town, and it was, it was inspired off, off the back end of your, of your inspirational, of your, of, your, of your idea and your initiative. And we, yeah, we executed it exactly the same way. We, 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 we collabed with a soup kitchen and we, we clothed over like two, 300 people, um, two, 300 homeless. So thank you to you for, for giving me that inspiration. So there's proof in the pudding. 
That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that story. I mean, even my wife, when she works at them, and my kids have worked at a number of street stores, Sarah always says to me that she gets more out of working at the street store than she thinks the homeless people get out of getting the clothing, because it is such a, a rewarding experience to, to be able to help people so meaningfully. So thanks. 100%. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to, and I'll let you know, and hopefully we can, we can collab. <laughs> Look forward to it. Um, uh, I mean, now we're just on the, I guess, the discussion of new ideas and visions. And I mean, this person really went out there and put their neck out there to try this, this idea. And then you know, they got to a thousand stores. How do you, I'm saying, especially in the marketing world or advertising world, when you on the line of controversy or you coming out with a new idea, how do you know and, and what, what mechanisms do you use to ensure that that vision or idea is actually going to be successful? And when do you know to push back or just accept other people's views and say, listen, what I'm thinking of doing here isn't right. It's not, a, it's not okay. And it's not actually going to be a success. Mm -hmm. I think there's a fine line, you know, in, especially in the space that you're playing. When do you back yourself to the hundredth percent or when do you just, you know, take a step back and actually take advice from other people around you? So I'm very comfortable uh, being wrong and getting inputs from other people. So I will never allow ego or position to um, uh, persuade me of something that I've considered as important, if it isn't important, or if it's not going to work. So I think that's the first thing, Hilly, is to leave ego at the door, because a lot of people, you know, are puffed up with self-importance and are too scared to be wrong. And so um, they would rather make a mistake than, than, uh, than back down. So that's the first thing. But I have a very simple measure in life that I apply to advertising, that I apply to strategies. And that is um, three words. Is it relevant? Is it original? And is it impactful? And those three letters also equal ROR, return on investment, as it happens. I haven't coined it. It's something I learned very early in my career. Um, and I look at that. The other thing I look at all the time is that cliched saying, but a very good one is there may be a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? And a lot of people come up with really clever ideas, but they are not commercially viable, as clever as they are. You know, I was reading a brilliant book, and I encourage all of your listeners to not to listen to the book. Um, it's written by Bob Iger, the global CEO of Disney for the last uh, 20 odd years. It's called Ride of a Lifetime. And he says, in his book that he invested uh, behind a female publication, a, a ladies' interest magazine, um, that was doing quite well, but compared to the other investments in the company, wasn't making a lot of money. And his boss came to him and said to him, Bob, be careful not to become the world's best trombone oil salesman, because even if you are the number one manufacturer of trombone oil in the world, they only consume five liters globally every year. And I think that a lot of people come up with really clever ideas, but where there isn't depth and there isn't a market, uh, a meaningful market for that product. The other thing I talk about, as I've referenced earlier, is cash flow, is blood flow. And very few people understand exactly how long that timeline is going to be for their business to take off. And you need to, under you need to ensure you have enough cash and you have enough investment that even if the runway extends longer, that you've got enough runway for liftoff. Because if you don't have enough money in the business, your idea can wither on the vine and somebody else can come up with that idea two or three years later and do phenomenally well. And there are many examples of brilliant businesses that just didn't have sufficient investment behind it for liftoff, where other people have entered the market later and done incredibly well in the same space. And I think we touched on that this is cash flow, people raising funding. It's now very topical, raising in Series A, Series B, venture capital. And it seems like a lot of capital being poured into private companies. At what stage do you think in a startup is the right time? Or how do you know when is the right time to start spending money on marketing? Do you do it as you launch? Do you do it when you cash flow positive? And how do you know when the right time is? I do think that that is where one's experience comes to the fore. Uh, and at the same time, it's a highly intuitive thing. So I'll give you an example. Um, a, a former client of mine, a man called Kim Reed, who when I ran Ogilvy was the CEO of MWeb, um, had uh, retired for a while and was looking for, I mean, he was a young man, but he was looking for a new investment opportunity. 
and then he bought a small um, e-tailer called Take Two that operated out of uh, Durbanville, Belleville area in Cape Town. And they sold CDs and they sold books. And Kim came to me and he said, I'd like you guys to do some marketing for Take Two um, to generate some awareness for this company. And it was at its inception. Uh, I'm going to give you two stories that you'll like uh, and actually quite related the two stories. So I sat down with Kim and we looked at Take Two. We did a bit of a basket analysis in terms of who was currently shopping from them and saw which uh, uh, opportunities existed to cross sell and upsell people to other products. And so we did some um, likelihood of purchasing other items. Um, but the other thing that we did is we looked at, and uh, they were at, in the early days of e-tail, e-commerce in South Africa, and the dominant player was Kalahari. And so looking at the business, I said to him, you know, the reason that nobody buys from Kalahari really um, is because of uh, instant gratification. When people want stuff, they want it now. They don't want to wait for a week. And we had a tiny client in the agency called Mr. Delivery. So I said to Kim, what about if we have a conversation with uh, David Chayat, who owns uh, Mr. Delivery, he was one of the partners there. And so um, I phoned Dave and I said, Dave, tell me when your um, customers aren't delivering, I'm um, sorry, aren't ordering Nando's for lunch or supper, a punt there for one of our other clients, uh, what are all of your drivers doing? And he said, well, it's actually, Huh? I feel like you've got to be very careful what you say. You've got so many clients. <laughs> Every second word, you've just got to watch yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get a clap from Robbie Rosen if I don't mention Nando's. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I said, what are all of your um, all your drivers doing? And he said, well, it's actually a problem. They're quite quiet. So Kim and I discussed it, and he met with the guys at uh, Mr. D, and he acquired them. And so when people weren't delivering uh, Nando's or... Uh, anything for lunch or supper, they would be delivering TV sets and tennis rackets and tackies. And, uh, and I think solving the problem of instant gratification was the silver bullet there. Hilly, it wasn't about an advertising campaign. Uh, the advertising campaign followed, but the first thing we needed to do was solve the fundamental business problem, which was the barrier to selling a lot of stuff. And then the other thing is why take two when you can take a lot? And so we rebranded the company and the rest okay. is their history. And then the other story is uh, Mr. D came to us originally, Mr. Delivery. And they said, you know, uh, for quite a while now, our service has been bad. This is way before um, uh, Take A Lot bought them. And at the time they said to us that uh, people were complaining that the food was taking a long, long to arrive and the food was arriving cold. And so what we did for the first time ever, I don't know if you remember the old uh, Mr. D logo, was that fat chef holding the cloche uh, and it said, what will it be? And so what we decided to do was to make that chef the fall guy for the poor service. So for the first time in history, a company actually fired its logo. We fired that chef for being uh, poor at his job. Yeah. And then we created this whole drama where the chef took us to the CCMA. He sued Mr. D. He phoned up radio DJs. He phoned up people like Helen Zilla with his Slavic accent. And he screamed over the phone about the unfair treatment. And uh, that was really six months after we started the agency. We won our first gold lurie for our Father Chef campaign. Wow. Amazing. I think it must be quite exciting to work with Archie and Sarchi. Well, I don't work be. with Sachi and Sachi. I work for MNC Sachi Abel. And yeah, I'll yeah. tell you that story as well. Do you know MNC the, Sachi Abel. Do you know the difference between our companies? Well, like from what I've researched, but I don't want to now embarrass myself online, to be honest. I'd rather let you tell us. Cool, I'll tell you. So Sachi and Sachi were started by two Iraqi Jewish boys. They left Baghdad. Their father moved them to London as teenagers. And then at the ripe old age of 23 and 25, with no experience in advertising to speak of, Morris and Charles, together with a man called Jeremy Sinclair, started uh, a company called Saatchi and Saatchi. And Saatchi, as a surname, is actually Farsi. It means watchmaker. So if you travel around the Middle East, if you're in Turkey, you'll see all of the watch repair shops are actually called Saatchi. And they started Saatchi and Saatchi. And then, you know, you spoke earlier about venture capital and private equity. In order to fund their global expansion, they had got into business with a company called Cordiant. And when Saatchi and Saatchi was the largest advertising agency in the world, a young man called David Harrow 
looked at the pro from Cordiant, looked at the profligate spending of one Morisachi, who was spending so much money on travel and on flowers and everything else, that he persuaded the board to demote Morris from being the executive chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi to being the CEO of the London agency. And Morris, as you can well imagine, uh, decided that wasn't going to happen in his own company. And so he walked out 25 years ago and he started MNC Saatchi with the same partners and founders that started Saatchi and Saatchi, exactly the same team. And so for the last 25 years, we've been MNC Saatchi. Not so, there haven't been any Saatchis at Saatchi, Saatchi and Saatchi. Wow. For 25 Is there still a Saatchi and Saatchi? Just out of interest. Sorry? Is there still a Saatchi and Saatchi? Oh, so. Yeah, yeah, it's still a major advertising group. It's owned by the French holding company called Publicis. Um, okay. and, uh, and in South Africa, we are the only uh, MNC Saatchi company globally with a local founder's name, and we are MNC Saatchi Able in this local market. Makes sense. See, you told it much better than me. <laughs> no, but you'll be surprised at how many of my clients even say the reason we came to Saatchi and Saatchi is because, and I say to them, sorry, chaps, but you're in the wrong building. <laughs> well, you've got nobody to send them, so you can use that line. But if Saatchi and Saatchi was down the road, you would have a trouble. You'd have a bit of a problem. <laughs> sure. Um, very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Um, Mark, just to jump onto the topic tonight, so just to steer mm. the conversation slightly more. I know it's been you know, an engaging discussion, getting to know one another, and you know, just learning about your past and you know, learning taking a lot of advice um you know the topic of tonight is we're not close to the end we we're close to a new beginning what does that statement you know mean to you um you, you wrote a book during such a crazy time to say the least during this year and you know speaking of covid and speaking of the last the last eight months or so what is what what has that done for the advertising industry and and you know what do we see going forward well, very early, uh, Ryan, we coined a term of not the new normal, but a better normal. And I'm in no way a fan of COVID insofar as people reflecting on all of the magic time that they've had at home with their family. I don't uh, necessarily, I mean, I adore my family, but I don't necessarily buy into that narrative. I think that that is Stockholm syndrome. Uh, I think people have fallen in love with their captor. And so they think that this is a special time. It's not a special time. It's a terrible time for the world um, economically because a huge amount of people have senselessly, in my view, lost their jobs uh, and lost their livelihoods. Um, obviously, there is, and let me put it out there, I mean, I obviously believe that for people who are elderly, um, certainly 70 plus, um, 75 plus even, um, and people who have comorbidities, it can be a very, very dangerous virus. Uh, so I don't want anybody misinterpreting what I say as a COVID denialist. I understand the perils of the disease fully. I also understand, according to research, that 99.9% .9 of people under the age of 70 who get COVID will recover. So there is a 0.1% um, fatality rate for people under 70. So uh, my fervent belief is um, the world has approached this poorly insofar as what we needed to do was to protect the elderly and to protect people who have comorbidities, not to apply a blanket uh, suppression to everybody. And, uh, you know, certain countries can afford to approach COVID in different ways to South Africa. So when you look at uh, what um, they've done in the UK and America uh, and the uh, packages that they've provided to support companies, we were never in a position, Ryan, to provide that within the South African context. So this thing has devastated people's lives, particularly as we know in the hospitality industry and South Africa is extremely reliant on tourism. Now, you then say, well, what are the positives? What is the beginning, not the end? And I think the beginning over here is for a company like ours, we always wanted to adopt a flexi working model. But you know, there's that old adage of if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And because our company was running so well with everybody working 350 people from two campuses, uh, you would check in at somewhere around about 8, 8.30 in the morning and you'd leave anywhere between, I guess, 5.30 and 10 o'clock at night, depending on what you did. And today we've seen how the agency on 20% of people now in my company are back at work. 
not much more than that. 80% of people are still working from home. What have we done during this time? Well, thank God with our um, we, we prioritized completely uh, job retention was number one for me, not bottom line delivery. And fortunately, my partners in London uh, bought into this idea that our first responsibility was to look after people's livelihoods and their lives. I think they're interchangeable terms. So we've retained 100% of our staff on 100% of their salaries throughout the COVID crisis. Okay, it has decimated our bottom line as a result, but we've also grown. We've done amazing things. We won um, a big project for TikTok. We did that campaign for them. We've done uh, uh, an enormous amount of um, of campaigns over this period of time. The biggest one of which was complete the complete repositioning and relaunch of Standard Bank with It Can Be as their new proposition and payoff line. Um, major campaign. Uh, we've hired 70 people in our company during COVID, of which some of them, as we speak today, we've never met. 50 of those 70 people we haven't met and have worked for the company for uh, four to six months. So um, we've all been engaging with the people using MS Teams Weekly, um, delivering stuff to their homes, sharing case studies, sharing work, keep, keeping people inspired. So I think that the one thing that the world has worked out is that there is an opportunity for a new model. The other thing that is really important for South Africa is we have brilliant talent here, Ryan, and geography and borders have always placed a huge constraint to South Africa. So when you've got unbelievable talent in a country and you've got a, a, a currency that has been devalued to the extent that our, ours has, suddenly a global market becomes uh, an opportunity for you, depending on what uh, areas of business you compete in. So I think that South Africa should concentrate on the opportunities that are born out of this, that we are now in a borderless world, that we can do business just as readily across a computer screen as we can as in a face-to-face -face meeting and seize that opportunity and mine it. Oh, Mark, well, I think your opportunistic and positive mindset is contagious. And, you know, it's something that we can all learn from, especially during times like this. You, there's a lot of negatives and to handpick the positives and to, to stem from those and really allow them to repel you is, is something that, you know, is, is respectful. And, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, just before I'm I jump in. Yeah, jump Sorry, in. Ron, I'm going to jump in. And, and, and Mark, I think... You know, Ryan just mentioned your, your energy and your sound is very contagious. And I feel that the same excitement energy um, exists within your workspace. But now, now you've gone into a digital world. How do, you, how do you ensure your company culture still remains the same? And how do you get your company culture out to your new employees we've never met? And then again, how does one who's a new employee actually, you know, instill themselves in the organization? How do they impress their new boss when they're working digitally and remotely? They can't have that, that human interaction. It's you know, do you think the world will go back to normal, these big offices once a, once a vaccine's been found or, you know, once a cure is actually found or I mean, what does the future look like? Okay, so um, a few questions in there and I'll... Yeah, I'll I, just, I just ran to the apologies. I can, I can break it down if you want. I got a bit excited. I'll follow you down that, uh, that path, don't worry. So I'll answer them sequentially based on what you've asked. So the first thing is... Um, how we've kept culture alive is um, understanding very clearly that what we need to do is to talk far more often to our people, uh, generally from a leadership position than we would ordinarily do, because it usually happens intuitively in the corridors around the uh, metaphoric water cooler and everything else. And so you need absolute direct interventions around uh, talking to the people. So what we have is a virtual breakfast twice a week for the Cape Town Agency and the Johannesburg Agency on a Wednesday and a Friday, where the MDs of those companies, the creative directors, the senior people um, uh, talk, to the pe talk to their staff, um, share case studies, share hot stuff that's happening around the world, share stuff that's happening within our company, and share just inspirational stuff. And then uh, a number of staff members, and they certainly don't need to be senior, they just need to have something interesting to share or talk about, are invited on. And so it's created an opportunity for a lot of people to have those. We have something called Friday Frames, where people come online and they share other stories. We have virtual drinks parties. We've had dress ups. We've had a whole lot of crazy stuff. So we've actually deliberately and strategically gone into overdrive, if you like, in terms of onboarding new people 
and connecting people and uh, and people feeling, I guess, the cultural glue of our company. Now, MNC Saatchi Abel had a strong culture before COVID. And I think it's very important that if your company had a weak culture before COVID, all COVID would do would be to widen the cracks. And so um, I think that when you are clear on who you are as a company, you're clear on what your purpose is as a company, you are committed to your people. I mean, one of the things that we had from the get go was an emergency fund for staff whose family that don't work for us, where people couldn't put food on the table, where we helped their extended families and sent groceries and food vouchers because what we knew is people wouldn't be able to cope if they knew that their families couldn't cope. Um, so I think that all of those interventions have been very powerful uh, in onboarding people. Um, all members of staff in the company, across our companies are getting my book. Um, I speak to the people in the company, it was once every week, I would be addressing all the staff. Um, it's now once a month and the other partners and co-founders in my company uh, talk to the staff all the time. So your question is, is it going to get back to normal? Well, I mean, the first question is who needs to have the vaccine for it to get back to normal? Now, I have little doubt that uh, with government agendas and not being a conspiracy theorist per se, but I think that they're going to ask everybody in the world to have the vaccine. Now, whether everyone in the world, and I'm certainly not an anti-vaxxer, I'm actually a pro-vaxxer, but I don't believe that everybody needs to have a vaccine where some where people under the age of 70 with no illness um, stands a 99.9% .9 chance of survival. But at the same time, then the question is, does that person then without a vaccine have the propensity to pass it on to other people? And if they do, then that becomes, I guess, the vexing question that needs answering. But I do believe that uh, you're not going to change human nature that has been going on for millennia uh, not just the 5,000 odd years of the Jewish religion, but for millions of years where people are social creatures, where we like to get together, where we like to do stuff together. And I think nothing can ultimately replace warm bodies in a building, working together, laughing together, having fun. So I'm hoping that we can take the positive lessons that we've learned out of COVID on board, but certainly that as many people that want to return to work, and want to be amongst other people feel comfortable doing so as soon as possible. I read an interesting article that said two years after the Spanish flu, the world was back to normal. I think people forgot about it straight away. And I think we're heading to something very similar. The world's craving social interactions, craving normality. Absolutely. Now I'm craving it. I think we all are. Yeah. I really think we all are. I mean, from the moment I could head back to the office, um, I did go back. And yeah. I've been there since uh, since the minute we were allowed to leave our homes, and I've seen the benefits of that in terms of my own um, happiness, I guess, and uh, and uh, well-being, uh, being in the office rather than being sitting in my study at home. Sure, interesting. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting time we all face with at the moment, um, and I think everyone thinks twenty twenty one is going to come and it's going to disappear, but I think it's just going to roll over. So we got to keep the positive attitude and keep 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 at it, as you say. I think you know there's a lot of people that can learn from not only young entrepreneurs or young drivers that are on this call, as well as established businessmen, how to run a company from a corporate culture perspective. You know, and 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 that's something exciting that we can all learn from. With that being said, um, you know you've chatted a lot about your corporate culture as well as your business as well as you touched on a few campaigns that you worked on. And, you know, I can't help to, to not bring it up and to, to, for something that's exciting um, as, as a young entrepreneur myself and, and, and interested in that digital ecosystem. What has been your most exciting campaign? Let's, you know, let's chat more in a positive light. TikTok, Superbolist, you got Lyft, there's Nando's drives, there's Willys. You still chatted to me earlier and you said that you're still adopting the new Standard Bank campaign, the Mr. Delivery you know, what has been the most exciting? When I looked on your website, if everyone here hasn't, hasn't seen the website, it's, it's honestly like a storyboard. It's so incredible. Um, so I would urge everyone to have a look there. But yeah, let's chat about that. So in terms of our clients, uh, so Lyft actually isn't a, a client of MNC Saatchi Abel. So it's our strategic marketing consultancy in our company called Black and White. They've been working with, uh, with Gidon on that. 
Uh, obviously, I've been watching it with interest, um, but um, uh, we'll see uh, exciting stuff certainly coming from them. Uh, I guess uh, rather than pick out a favorite, and, and we have done a lot, and obviously TikTok was a very exciting thing because of the nature of the channel um, and, uh, and the ability for people to engage with social media and to create their own content, I think has been fascinating. I mean, we've always encouraged people to uh, comment on our campaigns. You know, you look at Nando's, um, a lot of the Nando's work is around uh, engendering conversation uh, and interaction. You know, whether it's an ad that says, you know, in South Africa, we like to fix our shit and we do. And you see the Guptas running around, running away from South Africa, or we have commentary on what goes wrong and how we can get things right through the Mzanzi Poli board game. You know, there, there's there are lots of great campaigns, whether it's Coconut Kills on takealot.com, or as you say, the latest campaign for Superbalist, um, which kind of uh, celebrates individuality and your personal sense of style. Um, I think there, there are many examples. And I think, as you say, I'd love people to go onto the uh, MNC Saatchi ABLE website and have a look at them and engage with the work. Um, but one of the things that fascinated me apropos TikTok the other day was, um, there's this guy who's going to work. I don't know if you've seen this and his uh, car breaks down, his truck breaks down. And so he gets his skateboard out of the, the, the car and he hitches a ride on the back of a truck or a bucky as we would call it. Um, and he arrives at work uh, and he's the whole way that he's kind of cruising his lift to, uh, to work. He's drinking uh, a brand called Ocean Spray uh, and he's drinking the uh, cranberry variety and uh, he puts it to the music of Fleetwood Mac, a song called Rumors, which was a massive song in the 80s when I was still at school. Anyway, he arrives at work, Ryan, and he uploads it onto TikTok, and then uh, he goes about his work, his work day. I mean, he's, uh, he's uh, just an ordinary guy. He's not in marketing or advertising. I think he works in a warehouse or something. Uh, Nathan Apodoka, I think is his name. And then Nathan checks in at tea time and has a look at uh, if people have liked his TikTok and two and a half million people have watched it. And a week later, the sales of the ocean spray cranberry stuff has gone mad because he's drinking it on the back of the, 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 the bucky um, on his skateboard. And rumors for the first time in three decades enters the top 10 of iTunes in sales. Now you look at something like that and you'd say, well, for an advertising like agency like yours, do you view that as a threat? I don't view that as a threat at all. I view it as a massive opportunity because the whole thing is to engage with consumers, to engage with customers and to be a part of the conversation. So um, that is something for me outside of MNC Saatchi Able that I looked at that and I was mesmerized and it's just brilliant. I mean, another example, probably from four years ago, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched the video on YouTube for the Dollar Shave Club. Are you familiar yeah. with it? With the lion. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so the Dollar Shave Club, for those people watching that don't know, is someone was believed that it was uh, iniquitous, I guess, what the uh, companies, the big shaving companies charge for blades. And so they started a loyalty program to sell blades for a dollar each uh, and to deliver it to your house. And there's a piece of content when they started the Dollar Shave Club of the CEO that had absolutely no money. And it's the most hilarious thing of him talking about the Dollar Shave Club and what they do. And it's politically incorrect, deliberately so and funny. And I think over the first year, over 26 million people watched that ad, which cost nothing to make. Uh, and I think after two years, Unilever paid over a billion dollars for the company. So there are amazing new opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, to engage with their audiences in fresh and original ways, as long as it's relevant, original and impactful. ROI. There we That's go. <laughs> How do you justify then, absorb, like I say, how do you justify charging your client if, for instance, people can achieve the high ROI by doing this? Uh, well, very simply, uh, firstly, because they're unicorn events, so they don't happen every single day at all. <laughs> okay, uh, that's, you know, that's most, the crux. Exactly. Most content that consumers develop uh, don't hit the R or the O or the R. 
um, and it's just landfill, digital landfill. Uh, and our stock in trade is to solve problems, to understand what are the pulleys and levers for growth and how do we solve those problems? And then how do we unlock a greater market share for them? How do we unlock greater top line growth? And how do we unlock greater brand equity? And that doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't yeah. require, people come to us for our expertise. You know, it's like saying, you know, your granny can have a look at something and say, what is that growth on your ear? Uh, and then you go to a dermatologist and that person says, well, that growth on your ear needs to come off. Both of them can give you the same observation. One of them knows what they're doing, the other one doesn't. One of them you may listen to, the other one may save your life. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, I guess. I agree. Wow, <laughs> interesting. Sorry, Ryan, I just stole it again from you. No, no, it's an open discussion. Um, Mark, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, obviously this digital world that we live in, as, as Hilly was saying, it requires almost no sense of um, cost or no sense of intuition. It just requires a spur of a moment and a, and a, random, a random sporadic event. How does, how does your business complement that? Do you install in your creative designers to use these digital platforms to you know, encourage this insight because potentially one of them can build up into a billion dollar business. Is that, do you, do you use it as a compliment or is it just something that's sort of used on the side or how, how do you focus your advertising in that, in that sense? Cool. So I think that we are channel neutral. We don't obsess around which channel we are uh, on. So whether it's digital or television or radio or outdoor or direct mail, whatever it might be, we aren't brand focused either. So we don't think from a brand point of view, we think from a customer point of view. So being customer centric, if you know who your customer is, Ryan, then it becomes very easy to intersect the brand at the perfect time via the perfect channel. If you are brand centric, it's very easy to kind of lose sight of who the customer is and to be more focused on who you are than who the customer is and how they like to lead their lives. Uh, and if you look at the genius of a man, for example, like a Steve Jobs, his total obsession was giving people beautiful things that they would love and that, that they didn't know they needed them until they saw them. So nobody knew they needed an iPad until an iPad was in front of them. Nobody knew that they needed iTunes until it was a much better way. So our whole orientation is to solve problems for our clients in a way that makes them incredibly desirable and useful to their uh, potential customers more than their competitor brands. It sounds it's easy, tricky. it's tricky, but that's our it's job. It's a very subjective sort of task that you're dealing, you know, dealing with the 100%. specifics behind the brand, the specifics behind the people. And if it is a TikTok that 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 repels that business, then so be it. So that's that's sort of what I'm gathering, but that's you know very, very insightful. Um as a small, you know, we're gonna sign off. I know we got perhaps one more minute, but a small business owner, a young entrepreneur, you know, an established business owner, what sort of advice, what lessons do you have for these guys specifically advertising and then on a, on a, on a, on a not advertising, but more on a business growth sales perspective, commercial psychologist, as you would say, um, perspective. And then also from an everyday life to install that positivity, you know, speaking to that wide variety of the audience, what would you to say to sign off? Cool. So we have a wonderful saying. Uh, I used to work with a, a very brilliant man called Robin Putter, who sadly passed away in uh, 2010. But Robin had the saying, he didn't coin it, but he liked to use it, which is great advertising is about making the strange familiar and making the familiar strange. And what I mean about it, by that is a lot of people come up with a product and then they develop advertising and communication that makes what they're selling even more confusing as opposed to making it familiar. So they don't make the strange familiar, they make the strange stranger. I don't know what you're selling, now I really don't know what you're selling. Other people try and make the familiar even more familiar. So I already know what you're selling and instead of communicating with me in a fresh and interesting way, I'm going to tell you everything that you know already. Well, that's a complete waste of money and time. So I think that if you are in business and you want people to understand what you do, you've got to make it interesting, you've got to make it relevant, and you've got to make it resonant for them. But if it's not interesting, you are 
um, bombarded by so many offers, so many products, so many advertising messages a day, that unless you cut through the clutter with a simple, simple, sharp idea. So there's a wonderful story that I want to tell you about a lady and she's walking through India with her husband and she chances upon a tiny little man sitting on the side of the road and he's got a block of wood and he's got a knife. And she says to this little man, she says to him, tell me, sir, how do you create these mesmerizing lifelike elephants? And he says to her, it's very simple. I take my block of wood and I take my little knife and then I remove everything that isn't the elephant. And I think often in business, we layer stuff. We put extraneous nonsense around what we're trying to sell. And so people don't get the relevance and they don't get the resonance or the usefulness of what it is that we're trying to sell. So our modus operandi as MNC Saatchi Abel is something called brutal simplicity of thought. We believe that simple messages enter the brain quicker and stay there longer. That's a scientifically proven psychological fact. So we like to consider ourselves as a threshing machine that separates the wheat from the chaff. Okay. And then the last thing that I want to say is uh, to the people that are watching is negativity precipitates nothing but negativity and positivity begets positivity. Every day we have a choice. If you choose negativity, you are guaranteed a negative outcome. If you choose positivity, you might not achieve the outcome that you hope for, but you'll be in a far better position and far more likely to achieve a positive outcome. I love it. I love it. Um, I also think that that market in the gap, everyone thinks of the gap in the market and what you just spoke about, the market in the gap is also sort of brilliant. And that coupled with your positivity is, is a destined for success. Hilly, I'm going to hand over to you to sign off. Hey, Mark, I could literally sit here for hours listening to you. It's really been eventful. It's been great, truly inspiring. And I think, you know, there's something that the rabbi always reiterates, and sure, and it might be the right time to bring it up. You know, he says one of the Ten Commandments is do not steal. And on a deeper level, what that really means is do not rob the world of your talent. And I think you really have given back to the world. You've really done the most and, you know, we, you inspire the, the youth and we are really grateful to have you on the show, given of your time. And I'd like to thank you for your time and people have been messaging me to say, amazing, well done for tonight. They really have loved every second of it. So Mark, thank you very much for your time. It's truly been amazing and very inspirational. And hopefully when you launch your second book, we'll have you back. So from Great. our side, thank you. Discussing it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julian. Thank, thank you, Ryan. And thank Mark, you for, for inviting me. Thank you so much. Just before we sign off, um, I know if anyone might be interested in buying the book, I've posted a bit of information in the chat box um, that you can click on some links. And if it would be of interest, you can go check it out. So that's addressing the audience. But sorry to jump in. But thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you for your time. It's a thank great you, pleasure. Look, there's a lot more in the book. It's all about what we've discussed tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Cheers, guys.